Do you know what it's like to be forgiven? Do you understand what it is to have your sins washed away in the blood of Christ? Do you know what it means to have not long, no longer be what you used to be, but God's made you a new creature in Christ Jesus? Amen. If you don't know that from the heart, then my dear friend, you don't know it at all. Because it's not a matter of convincing yourself in your head that you're right with God. From the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. When you look at the 51st Psalm, you'll see that David repented. Chapter 51, verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God. He's crying out to the Lord. And David confessed. Look at verse number 4 of Psalm 51. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil. His heart is pouring itself out to God. And when the heart pours itself out to God as the sinner, to my dear friend, there's going to be some confession. The Lord Jesus said, I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You so you mean the Lord said there are righteous people? No. The Bible said in the book of Romans, there is none righteous. No, not one. So what did he mean, preacher? He meant simply this. When that Pharisee walked in and he looked before God and he said, I thank you, Lord, that I'm not as other men. You know, I do this, I do that, I do this. He was righteous in his own eyes. But when that sinner walked in there and he pounded his chest, said, God be merciful to me, a sinner. The Lord Jesus said he went down to his house justified. Christ is the answer for every sinner that's ever walked the face of this earth. Amen. Not religion, not the church, not, not to turning over a new lead, but the Lord Jesus Christ. So we read over here in Psalm 51 and verse number 1. Notice what he says. He says, please have mercy upon me, O God. He's pleading for God's mercy. He didn't say, God, be just with me. He didn't say, God, I want justice from you. He said, Lord, I want mercy. And when you cry out to God for mercy, you'll get mercy. Job chapter number 42 and verse number 6, Job cried, Wherefore I abhor myself, and I repent in dust and ashes. Any man that's ever come face to face with God, that you've come before the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, the true and living God, the only God there is. All the rest of the gods are created things by the hands of men or demons. The one true and living God when Job came before him he said I abhor myself. He didn't say I love myself he said I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Repentance therefore is a gift from God. The Bible said in the book of Acts chapter 11 verse 18, then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. It comes from God. You say preacher you mean I can't just decide to repent? No you can't because that's like a New Year's resolution. You decide you're going to change your life. You're going to do better. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. But it's not long before you're right back to the same pit you started from. The Bible said in the book of Acts chapter number 5 and verse number 31. For to give repentance to Israel. Then in 2 Corinthians 7 and verse number 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance. In other words, you agree with God. When you really begin to agree with God about who you are and what you're made of and what goes on inside your soul. And you allow God to begin to talk to your heart and not your mind. When you allow God to speak to the depths of your soul, then you're a candidate for repentance. When you stop resisting the Holy Spirit, when you stop grieving the Spirit of the living God, then you're a candidate for repentance. The Bible said in Luke chapter 13, verse 3, I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Then in Luke chapter 16, verse 30, he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one go unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. This is a spiritual book. The words are spirit, and the words are life. The Word of God was quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. The entrance of thy words giveth light, giveth understanding to the simple. God had him eat the Word, and when he ate it, it tasted like honey. But once it was in the stomach, it made his belly sore. There's something about the Word of God that speaks to us like nothing else does. And here's why. The Bible is alive. This book is alive. Therefore, if you'll believe what God says, 
says in his word, you can be a candidate for repentance. We've got a generation today that preaching that repentance is not necessary. They're telling people that repentance is works. John chapter number 16 verse 7 says this, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. Yet if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me. Repentance, therefore, is a work of the Holy Spirit of God. This is why people that repent, they repent out here in the world of worldly sorrow. They get tired of being hungry. They get tired of not being able to pay their bills. They get tired of their problems. And so they turn over a new leaf. They try something different. It may work and it may not work. But in any sense of the word, in no way does it draw them closer to God. Only God can draw you closer to God. And the Holy Ghost, when He comes, He will come and He will convince the world of sin because they believe not on Christ. The Apostle Paul said to the church at Corinth, Now rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold this selfsame thing, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort. What careful it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. In all things you have approved yourselves to be clear in this manner. One thing he said, all this clearing of yourselves. That word clearing comes from the Greek word apologia. You ought to know that in English, apology. But in Greek it means something different than it does in English. In Greek it means that I expose myself. I am what I am and I don't like what I am and I want God to do something to help me that's what I want don't you want that I want God God's got to do something for me I've got to have something spiritual or I'll drive down the bone out here in this world all you get is a bunch of flim flam materialistic nothing for nothing for nothing and they don't know what they're talking about and they don't know where they're going because they have no light and they have no sense of God in their soul. Vast number of our churches today are preaching a feel-good message. As a result, people feel entitled, self-absorbed. God becomes their personal genie. In other words, just rub him the right way and God will pop up and give you everything you want. God becomes your servant. This is the kind of stuff that is preached from the pulpits in this country week after week after week. So because of that we have a loving, self-loving, materialistic, dead religion that calls itself Christian. The Bible said that judgment begins first at the church of God. What shall be of them that obey not the truth? We're speaking this morning to you. Here you sit in the congregation. You're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. If we don't have any light in here, if we don't have any discernment in here, there is none. For they sure don't. And so when we come together as God's people, we should come together in prayer and say, Lord, show me thy way. Teach me thy way. It has done nothing. This so-called materialistic dead religion has done nothing about letting to 60 million babies offered on the altar to Molech. It's done nothing about letting sodomite drag queens come into the schools to recruit our children. And now these television, one television network has dragtistic, I think it is, a play on the word of fantastic. They're going to have drag queens week after week spreading their stuff before people. Are, are you watching that garden? Are you that sick? That something needs to go on in your soul if you're not upset by that. The Bible says in the Old Testament book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter number 19, what Lot was in Sodom, Peter said his conscience was vexed by the filthy conversation of the wicked. You're living in Sodom, folks. You're living in the midst of Sodom. You say, what's that got to do with us? It's got everything to do with us. As a result of this, the church had become blind. When you close your eyes to spiritual truth, when you begin to accept what the world accepts, you no longer can see the way you should be able to see. Blindness comes upon you. So what happens when the blindness comes upon us? 
Well, then if blindness is upon us, then my dear friend, we are in a bad condition for this country because they sure don't know what the truth is. Psychics are doing a booming business now because they want some answers. They're calling these psychics. They're advertising on television all the time. Uh, we'll talk to you for a dollar a minute, then two dollars a minute, then whatever. Make no mistake about it, they want their money. Like they know what they're talking about. And people are losing confidence in the system. The Lord Jesus said you judge a tree by the fruit it bears. You're going to hear all kinds of babble. You're going to hear babble. And it reminds me of Nimrod in Babylon. The babble means that when they were building the Tower of Babel, God changed the languages and they couldn't communicate with each other. I don't know how many languages came out of it, but these people could not communicate. That's what's happening now. Because there's all kinds of confusion coming out. Everybody's got a take on this coronavirus. Where did it come from? What's it about? They're questioning. Was it a Chinese wet market? Was it bushmeat? 3,400 years ago, God told Moses to tell the children of Israel what they could eat. Long before anybody knew anything about a virus or a bacteria. And you know what? Because Israel stuck to that cleanliness and to that diet when the Black Plague moved through Europe and it killed millions of people. The Jews were not dying like the rest of the people were. And this is where blood libel comes in. They blame the Jews for the plague that moved through Europe. And the reason the Jews weren't dying, they were eating according to what Moses told them to eat. 1,400 B.C. Your diet is very important. What you eat. Washing your hands is important. Human hygiene is important. But boy, I'll tell you right now, has something that you can't see with your eyes brought the entire world to its knees? Yes. Is it bankrupting people? Yes. Is it closing businesses that will never open again? Yes. Is this nation going into debt by trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars to try to bail people out? Yes. Is it changing the political scene? Yes. We've got the globalists out there that were moving pell-mell and they, had, they were open borders and the globalists, this globalist, that. But now it's changing. So what's going to come out of it? Watch it. You judge a tree by the fruit it bears. Are we headed for World War III? Yes. Because the Antichrist will rise bringing peace. This is what Daniel said. By peace he shall deceive many. The Antichrist is about peace. When we get into the tribulation that's soon coming, we've got four distinct groups of people. If we get this first part, it'll help us understand a lot about the tribulation. Who are they, preacher? They're Gentiles. There's Jews. There's believing Gentiles and believing Jews. That's the four groups. Did you know what, folks? When you get right with the Lord, there'll be a song in your heart. Have you lost your song? Sing a new song that Bible talks about. Praise unto God. Lift up His holy name. The Lord's good, David said. He forgave me, cleansed me. Hallelujah to God. I'm not what I used to be, and I'm not, folks. Thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. i got a long line of bones behind me, but praise God, I've got nothing but light before me. Amen, amen, amen. But he says this, one of the elders answered, saying to me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? Whence did they come? And I said, Sir, you know. He said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That's the only thing that will make your robes white. And that's the only thing that will wash your sins away, is the precious blood of Christ. This is this revival they're talking about, where thousands, yea, millions are saved. Where is that preacher? In the tribulation period, the time of Jacob's trouble. There's a lot of things happening, a lot of things that don't make sense right now. And let me tell you why. I want you to listen to what Peter said. This is important in understanding the Bible. 1 Peter chapter number 1, verse 10. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. That's the two distinct comings of Christ. But look at the next verse. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, the ones doing the prophesying, not unto them, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you, for the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Now here's what the Lord says in Matthew 11. All the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if ye will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. So what's all that mean, preacher? It means this. It means that I firmly believe that there are sections of this Bible that can only be understood and made sense of at the time. 
Imagine if you're here, Tribulation Saint, what are you going to turn to? You're going to turn to Revelation. That's where you're going to turn, the book of Revelation. Now I've got something I need to tell you this morning that's precious to my heart and to my soul. I'm looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. I am looking for His appearing because I'm going to tell you something. I don't think it's going to get better. I think this is a wake-up call. I think God is a gracious God, and I think He's giving people an opportunity. You remember what He said in in the book of Revelation? He said, I gave her space to repent, and she didn't repent. This is a wake-up call. God is speaking to people. Will you listen?